Okay, so my work focuses mostly on um, the statistical mechanics of active systems and the motivation for the work I'll present today is to introduce a new class of active systems which I will call pulsating active matter and this class of system is inspired by the dynamics of living cells and tissues so I will present you interesting collective effects which emerge in this class of systems some of which you can uh, already see here and I hope that by the end of the talk you'll be convinced that indeed this class of system deserves further attention. So the starting point, let me remind you very briefly what is active matter. Indeed, we already had a few talks on active matter, so I don't need to be very extensive on that. Uh, maybe I should say the broad definition, active matter is the class of non-equilibrium systems where every component extracts energy from its environment and uses it to produce a sustained dynamics. And in most cases, one assumes that this sustained dynamics takes the form of direct in motion, which means that motile particles extract energy and use it to self-propel. There are many instances of this type of motile particles. For instance, the Julius colloid shown here is a famous instance of a synthetic microswimmer. And what's so interesting with these colloids is that when you consider many of them, you can see clustering as shown here. This is again something we've seen uh, in the previous talks. And as a theoretician, we like to build minimal models which capture this emergent behavior and what is often assumed is that the self-propulsion is essentially a source of persistent fluctuations. It means that motile particles are particles which have a tendency to keep moving in the same direction during a given persistence time and this is actually sufficient to consider uh, fully repulsive particles and to have a phase separation as shown here which is well known as the motility induced phase separation. So much more recently, what people have studied doing is to consider dense regimes of active matter. And again, we had a few talks in this regime during this conference. And I think it's fair to say that the motivation to consider this regime is to reproduce the dynamics of living cells in dense biological tissues. So indeed, if you consider, uh, for instance, this uh, monolayer of MDCK cells, in a confluent layer, each of these cells is constantly in contact uh, with its uh, neighbor. And the dynamics of these cells is very fluctuating. It's powered both by thermal fluctuations, which come from the thermostat, and also by active fluctuations, which typically are powered by the hydrolysis of an ATP fuel. Interestingly, to try and uh, reproduce the behavior of cells in tissues, what many people have been doing is to use the same ingredient as that of the active colloids and to transfer them into the dynamics of cells in tissues. So what you do is that you consider that each cell is a tile of this form and you end up each cell in a tissue with a self proportion force again. So you have a self proportion vector whose orientation diffuses independently for each part. So you also have interaction in this type of system where you say that the interaction with the neighbors are such that you would like to minimize the distance from a given reference value for perimeter and area for each of these cells. So this has been extremely successful as a model in capturing a rigidity transition where as a function of the strength of the self propulsion and as a function of the reference value of the perimeter, you have a transition between fluid and solid state where, as you see, the fluid consists of having trajectories which can spar the whole system, whereas in the solid state, you see that the trajectories of the cell are much more confined in a given area of the system. So as I said, this has been very successful, but what is surprising to me, and I think to some people as well, is that in this sort of approach, you assume that the only effect of the activity is to power the motility of the particles, and you completely discard any other potential types of active fluctuations which emerge in this type of tissues. So in particular, what is well known is that another way to have active fluctuations for cells in tissues is that these cells can undergo periodic mechanical deformations. So under some experimental uh, conditions, you can show that actually this type of deformation is locally synchronized. So as you see in this series of snapshots, we have uh, here some cells which are tagged. This is again an NDCK monolayer. And you see that over the course of 100 minutes, these cells are collectively expanding and contracting. So if you now combine two ingredients, one is that you have local contraction and expansion in a periodic fashion. And the other ingredient is that this uh, sort of uh, monolayer is confluent, which means that the packing fraction is constant. You immediately see that this can lead to the propagation of a contraction wave in the system. 
So the formation of contraction waves is something that has been seen in many experiments. I'm just showing you one here, which I think is uh, very illustrative. So in this uh, chymograph, as a function of time and space, what you see here are uh, these uh, yellow stripes, which corresponds to uh, activation of ERK, which is a protein which is the marker of contraction. And you see that uh, this contraction wave can propagate over large distances, namely of 100 of microns, clearly beyond a few neighbors. Yes, yeah. That's a good point. So if indeed the, the number of cells is not constant, right, you could have contraction and expansion without having a wave. The idea is that if you consider that the number of cells is constant, if you contract somewhere, you have to expand elsewhere just to maintain the packing fraction, right? Uh, so I think in this precise case, uh, there is always cell base and cell division, but this was uh, not uh, preempting the emergence of waves, right? But that's a very good point, yes. In this uh, very simple picture, to describe this experiment and also in the model that will follow, I will completely neglect this process, which is actually here in your biological tissues. Yes, thanks for this point. Okay, so waves emerge in biological tissues. This is something which has been known already for quite a while. Yes? So in the development process, I mean, again, you have this kind of uh, wave propagation when, for example, uh, like a baby is growing or something. So, so it's, um, it's a bit different, I would say, during embryogenesis, you have large-scale flows, right? Uh, so so the, usually the, the, the minimal settings where you very clearly seen contraction waves are uh, ty typically in vivo experiments with component monolayers, right? Here, uh, this is this type of setting where you can uh, try and define very clearly the wavelengths and the speed of the waves. So this is the setting you lack of as a physicist where you neglect all the biological complexity. Uh, whether this has also a role in embryogenesis, I, com I, I can't be sure for the moment, right? So I would say as a physicist, I'm more interested in this minimal setting, which is very well controlled. Embryogenesis is a bit more complex. I would say in embryogenesis, you are more interested in large scale flows, right? So in that respect, this rigidity transition was very relevant for embryogenesis because it tells you what are the conditions under which you can have flows of cells developing, right? I'm more interested in the emergence of uh, contraction waves, which are very well studied in vitro. So contraction waves are here. This is something which has been known for quite a while. And really, the motivation of this talk is to convince you of the fact that it's sufficient to consider active deformation instead of motility of the barcode and to capture the emergence of these contraction waves. So to convince you of that, I will uh, propose indeed a minimal model of uh, deforming particles, and I will try and identify the regime in parameter space where these waves emerge, and I will characterize the corresponding transitions. So this will be most of the talk. And hopefully by the end of the talk, if time allows, I will try and build an analogy between the patterns which emerge in this type of minimal model and the patterns of reaction diffusion dynamics. OK, so let's start with this minimal model of deforming particles. And to describe this type of system, I will consider a phase space which consists, of the, uh, which consists in the position of particle and in an internal degree of freedom, which I will call the phase. And in practice, the phase of the particle, theta i, determines the size of the particle, sigma i. So in this relation, I have introduced two parameters, sigma naught here, which is a reference value for the radius, and lambda, which couples indeed the phase to the radius. And in lambda, I will take values between 10 and uh, 5%. So the fluctuations of the size will be quite small in practice. So when the phase varies between pi and minus pi, you see that the particle size will vary. In practice, I will only focus in two dimensions in what follows, and I will take isotropic uh, repulsion. And in what follows, I will take the big particles to be in green, and the small one will be in pink. OK, very good. So the dynamics is given as such. So as you see, it's an assembly of a Langevin equation. Of course, the dynamic is stochastic. The first line which rules the dynamics of position is the one that you would have for a passive system. The interactions here are uh, purely repulsive and uh, short range. So whenever the interparticle distance is smaller than the sum of the radii, there is no interaction. Much more interesting is the dynamics of the phase. You see there is a drive omega here, which says that in the absence of interaction, the particle would like to expand and contract periodically. And then you have two types of other interactions. You have here the synchronization, which is local. So you only synchronize your phase with your neighbors. It has a finite range, which is exactly the range of the repulsion. And there is also this term here in the dynamics of the phase, 
which says that if a particle expands and if it overlaps with the neighbor, this will impede the expansion of the particles. Okay, so this is the model. And let me point out that this type of model was first proposed by Togashi a few years ago. And what I would like to show you now is that indeed this entails the formation of waves and I can study the corresponding transitions. Okay, so as a first dive into the phenomenology of this model, perhaps the simplest thing to do is to measure the order parameter here, which quantifies how many particles are cycling in phase. And you can measure the average parameter, the average value of this parameter as a function of the synchronization strength, epsilon, and as a function of density. And if you do so, you very clearly distinguish two regions of ordered state. As you see, there is this yellow region here at moderate density and high synchronization. And there is also the ordered state at high density. So from this phase diagram, I would like actually to distinguish three phase boundaries. There is the one here at high density, which is uh, merely depending on density. And then on this line, I would like to distinguish actually two boundaries, one which corresponds to epsilon decreasing with density, and the other where epsilon increases with density. OK, so let's start by considering the easy transition, which is the one which appears at small density, where epsilon decreases with density. And indeed, it's simple, because in this regime, there is enough space for the particles to expand and contract with only minimal contribution due to the repulsion. Therefore, to first approximation, you can completely neglect repulsion in the phase dynamics, and you end up with a dynamics of this sort, which is very much akin to what we know as the Kuramoto model. And as for the Kuramoto model, you know that the transition is a competition between the synchronization of the, and the noise, so that when the product between density and synchronization strength is smaller than the noise, you have a disordered state. Whereas when the uh, synchronization strength is large enough, you have a global cycling where all particles are cycling their phase together. Okay, so I don't mean to say that this type of scaling, which is mean field, is indeed quantitatively accurate here, but at least to first approximation, it captures the physics, which is that if, when you sit at the phase boundary and if you increase either density or synchronization, you go from disorder to order. So let's see now what happens when you go to higher density, which is much more interesting. So we have higher density, now I have to take into account the role of the repulsion. And let me do that by focusing on a regime of very high synchronization, where I will be able, again, to use mean field arguments. So when the synchronization is overwhelming, the first thing you can do is that you can neglect the contribution of the noise. And moreover, you can assume that all the particles have the same phase. Therefore, you're back to a simple uh, deterministic one body dynamics. And you can have an explicit dependence of the potential U on density and on phase simply by realizing that the interval this scales like the inverse of the density. We are in two dimensions again. And by realizing that there is an explicit dependence between phase and uh, the size of the particle, which I gave you before. So then to understand what's happened with this type of simple one body dynamics, it's sufficient to look at the tilted potential, which is shown here. And as you see, you can distinguish two cases. Either you have a series of minima when the density is high enough, or at smaller density, you have simply a potential here which has not any minima. So what we deduce from that is that you can have a case at low density where you have a current of phase. This will correspond to the global cycling. But interestingly, when the density is high enough, you see that the phase will be trapped in one of these minima, and therefore it will completely kill uh, the current of the phase. OK, so this is the mean field picture. Let's see how it compares uh, with uh, particle-based simulations. So these are two simulations at two different densities, 1.1 and 1.9. And again, the color of the particle is simply their size. You can see that, indeed, at 1.1 density, you have a globally cycling state, where all particles are expanding and contracting together. Whereas at much higher density, you have this state where all particles have the same size. And indeed, the reason for that is because there is not enough space for them to expand. So they try to expand, and then they are stuck at a given size. OK, very good. So what we learned from that is that actually these two order states are quite different nature. At high density, there is not any current in the phase, whereas at low density, you need to have a cycling of phase. OK, so this was the mean field picture. And uh, if this was a genuine representation of the many body dynamics, then it would say that I would go directly from uh, 
ordered arrested state to an ordered cycling state by reducing the density. But in practice, what you see in the simulation is that there is this pocket here, which tells you that there is another phase in between these two order states. So where does it come from? So to understand where it comes from, the first thing to do is perhaps to introduce fluctuations back into this min picture. So if you introduce fluctuations back, you see that when you have this type of configuration, actually there could be a noise fluctuation which brings the phase from one equal minimum to the next. And this means that when you reduce the density from uh, the uh, arrested state at uh, higher density, you will be able to have now a coexistence where some particles will be trapped in the local minimum, but others will be able to go from one minimum to the next. Very interestingly, when you have this coexistence between arrest and cycling particles, you will see that you have the emergence of this type of stripes, which are uh, indeed corresponding to wave or particles with equal phase. And because the particles are cycling this, their phase, these type of waves will be able to propagate in the system. So let me show you again uh, dynamics of this sort. So we have here uh, two type of uh, simulations where we simply vary the value of lambda from 0.1 to 0.005. And you can see in both cases that we have indeed a coexistence between a background of arrested particle and particles which can cycle their phase. Interestingly, you can see that these stripes are basically connecting to a defect with opposite charges which uh, rotate. And you can have either an extensive number of defects with this form, which are constantly being created or annihilated. Or you can have this type of configuration where you have a single pair of defects, which is connected by a very long stripe of particles. OK, very good. So this is uh, quite encouraging. Um, it shows that our minimal model is actually able to capture the contraction wave. This is the first check. And we understand that these waves essentially emerge from a coexistence between arrest and cycling. So if I reduce further the density, then there will be more and more particles which are able to cycle. And actually, I can arrive at the point here in the phase diagram where the order parameter is very close to 0, which corresponds to all the particles cycling in the system. When you are here, you go from essentially these defect turbulence, which are very close to the arrested state, to this type of uh, configurations, which are closer here to r equals 0. And when you see this type of uh, configurations, you see that now the waves are essentially organizing on the length scale, which is all the order of system size. So in this type of uh, configuration, you can have different type of waves. You have, for instance, spiral waves, as you see on the left, with a defect at the core and then defect also at the edges of the system. And very clearly, you see that indeed the, the structure organizes over the whole system size. You can also have uh, this type of circular waves, which again organize on the order of system size. Yes? Ah, OK. Thanks for the question. Yes, the defects here are uh, defects in uh, phase, right? That's right. So it means that if I measure the phase around a defect, I have a, I have a jump, basically, right? And more precisely, this is either a plus or minus one defect, which means that when I do a uh, contour integral of the phase around the defect, I have a 2 pi shift. Right. And the reason why this is a plus or minus one defect is because the synchronization is polar. Right. This is a direct consequence of that. Yes. So these are defects not in position space, but in space space. Yes. So if you look at the spiral wave uh, essentially coming out, right? It is being expanded. Can you have a situation where it is uh, actually marking the uh, it's uh, hmm. it's, uh, converting and then expanding. Do you have that kind of system? This is really kind of system. I, I do not. Uh, I'm not sure why. That's a good. That's a good question. Uh, I do not. No. No. Indeed, the waves that we see here, they always seem to uh, propagate outwards. Yes. Uh, I. Um, so that's that's a good question. So you can see here, basically, you have a defect pair. You have one at the core, and one at the very end, right? Uh, but what you. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'm not sure whether the core of the defect always has the same charge, right? So could you have also spiral waves, which instead of going like that, uh, would go would go the other way? This is this is not exactly your question, but it's related to the question. So this is I cannot answer unfortunately at the moment. And then can you have things which which somehow 
uh, seems to uh, to go well for the, for the spirals. Uh, so this is spiral, but for the circular, uh, you could argue well this is this is something I think which is closer to what you are asking this type of configuration. Um, but no, I don't have I don't have a clear answer on that. Uh, is it the same example that you are showing? There is a set of uh, four or five cells uh, which uh, expand and then contract. Yes. And then that, that is the really cycle probably going on. Yes. So that scenario c c can you reproduce here or? Uh? That, that's, so that's actually what is, this is supposed to be corresponding to, right? Because when you see these uh, colors, this corresponds to uh, patches of cells with equal size, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that this is a the, the pink is a patch of cells which are contracting together, right? And the uh, the, the green is a patch of cells which expand yeah, together. Expanding. Yes, yes. So these these are ways uh, that we see here. Um, so interestingly, you could also have a zero defect solution of this sort, where you have um, you would have um, planar waves. If if we think of comparison with experiments, typically mm. the experiments which are done to promote the waves, it's easier to do it with an aspect ratio which is not one, and then you would have planar waves which propagate along mm -hmm. the long direction. Mm -hmm. This is something that we see in the model, yes. Mm -hmm. I think what is uh, even more striking here is that you could have this spiral forming, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know of any analogy of these spiral waves in um, MDCK Limonarias, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, but if you, if you think that this model can represent a larger class of systems, for instance, you know that in, in heart tissues, mm -hmm. uh, this you, is, you, this you is the... You do see a spiral wave, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is something that happens very clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, this type of waves is 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 a critical moment because it's a, it's a signature of of uh, mm. uh, tachycardia of of this type of of, of behavior for yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. for heart tissues. Um, so yeah, long story short, this this has plane waves, which we see in the MDC kilometers, but actually this model has even more than that, which I think is is mm -hmm. uh, is interesting in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, very good. Um, excellent. So um, we have waves. That's very clear. These waves are can be regarded as emerging from the dense RC state, as uh, as because it, it's basically a coexistence between arrested and cycling particles. And what I would like to discuss now is what happens if you reduce even further the density. Because you can see that from this phase diagram, if you reduce even further the density, then you, you destabilize the waves and you are back to the fully cycling state, right? So this is something I would like to understand. And in particular, as I was arguing a few slides ago, I would like to, to show you that this transition here, uh, which corresponds to epsilon increasing with Ronald, which is a transition between global cycling and waves, is very different in nature from the transition at smaller density. OK, so now I would like to be a bit more quantitative by looking at uh, what happens at the transition beyond the average of the order parameter. And I would like to consider now the full distribution of its order parameter. And to do so, I will consider points uh, A density and point 3 density, which corresponds here to uh, transition along this direction and transition along that direction. And let me say, now that what happens here at 1.3, density is actually robust everywhere here along this phase boundary. So for point A density, you see that when you vary the synchronization strength across the phase boundary, the distribution of the order parameter stays unimodal. It goes from blue to red, and this corresponds to the peak of R values going to close to zero and uh, from close to zero to, to a higher value. You can also do this experiment here, where at fixed density you increase uh, the value of epsilon, which leads to indeed increase the value of R. So you go from disorder to order. You can do the reverse. You start from the ordered states and you decrease epsilon. And if you compare these two curves, they're very close to one another. In short, this means that this transition is, in the language of equilibrium status quantum mechanics, a continuous transition or a secondary transition. Now let's see what's happening at 1.3 density. You see that now when I cross the phase boundary, I go from unimodal to bimodal, right? So this means that now there is a whole regime of metastability where you have competition between two collective states, which is either the wave state or uh, the global cycling. And correspondingly, if you measure uh, this uh, type of curve where you either increase or decrease epsilon, you have a strong hysteresis which appears, which is again a signature of metastability in the system. Okay, so what do we learn from these curves? Well, clearly, 
these two transitions are different in nature, one is continuous, the other is discontinuous, it means that while the repulsion play no role in this continuous distributed transition, the role of the repulsion seems to change the nature of the transition. Okay, so this is, I would say, a bit pedantic as a statement, but it's interesting in itself. What I would like to tell you now is that we can do more than that than just characterizing the order of transition. We can look for a mechanical insight into why you have this transition between waves and global order. Basically, the second order and the first order line. That's right. And that they're meeting on this uh, interesting point. Uh, so, so, so that's, so I'm not as, as precise as that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm a bit less, a bit more. Uh, no, then, then you can have uh, multi-critical points, which, uh, uh, yeah, if, if is there some signature of that? In principle, yes. Where is the critical, where is the tricky, tricky critical point? I'm not sure, right. Uh -huh. What I'm saying is that everywhere here, I'm sure that you have a regime of bistability, yes? Mm -hmm. But where these bistability stability dies off to begin continuous, I'm not sure exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. So schematically, I would say these are two phase boundaries, but actually where, where is the point where they merge, I, we do not know mm -hmm. now for the moment, yes. But there has to be a point somewhere, yeah. They're all steady state. Yes. Uh, I know, uh, yeah, so these, these are steady state measurements, obviously, and for the, for the hysteresis, you do that in finite time, right? So, so, so here, the relaxation of the system matters, right? And this is why you have this uh, metastability, of course, uh, which is that you're, you're doing that slowly, but not slowly enough to, to basically uh, find exactly the same path forward and backward. Okay, good. Um, so the motivation was to go beyond just characterizing the order of transition, but also look for a mechanical interpretation of the instability, which leads to wave or to global cycle. So to do that, let me do a, a to take a small detour by looking at the statistics of a current, which is defined here in such a way that you see I uh, summing over the instantaneous velocity of the phase and I'm scaling these values such as the current is one whenever all the particles are cycling at their bare frequency. So if you look at the average value of this current, you see it's quite uninteresting. It completely misses the transition happening here in this region. And you see that the average value will simply uh, go to zero in the ordered arrested state as expected. Much more interestingly, if you look at the variance of the current, you see that now there is a very clear signature which corresponds to the transition between waves and global cycling. So why is it so? So to try and understand that, you can actually look at the trajectory of the current. So this is the blue curve here, current as a function of time. And we look at this trajectory for two cases, either the waves on the right or the global cycling on the left. So in both cases, what you see clearly is that you have uh, oscillations and that the amplitude of oscillations are much reduced for the waves, which explain clearly why the variance drop abruptly when you go to a wave state. So what we do here is that we actually compare the oscillations of the current with the oscillations of the packing fraction, which are shown in red. And what you realize is that there is actually a phase shift of pi over 2 between these two oscillations. So what does it mean? It means that whenever the packing fraction is increasing, right, you will see that the current is always smaller than its average value. And the reason for that is because when the particles are increasing their size, because they overlap beyond the given point, this will impede the growth of the particle, right? So what you deduce from that is that the oscillation of the current is a direct signature of the increased overlap of the particles. So this means that this transition between the global cycling and the waves is basically a competition between two collective states. Either you uh, try to favor synchronization at the cost of overlap, this is why you have huge amplitude, or you rather try to favor a reduced overlap, but this is at the cost of a reduced synchronization, right? So this transition from here to here is telling you that if you either increase the density or reduce the synchronization, you go from a state which leads to, indeed, reduced overlap at the cost of uh, reduced synchronization. OK, very good. So this was um, all on this first part. And well, I hope it's clear by now that 
it's quite a rich phenomenology, uh, which only relies on the active deformation of particles. There is not any motility here. And indeed, it leads uh, to formation of contraction waves, which can uh, stabilize very nice patterns. So as I was saying in the introduction, there is an, an obvious, at least visual, analogy between the patterns in this type of model and that of reaction diffusion dynamics. So now in the second part, I would like to be a bit more quantitative in building this analogy. So to do so, I will present uh, another type of model. And I will argue that this is yet another instance of pulsating active matter. So this is a model which is a bit uh, more abstract in the sense that we do not have any mechanistic interpretation as for deforming particles. But hopefully, it has all the essential ingredients at play for pulsating active matter. So the starting point here is to realize that for deforming particles, the density profile is flat everywhere in the phase diagram. Therefore, to first approximation, you can actually assume that you could neglect the role of repulsion in the dynamics of the position, right? So let's do that. And let's consider simply a jump process where particles on a given side i can jump to neighboring sites without any constraint on density. So it's purely free diffusion. Moreover, each particle can be in either one of three states, which are meant to mimic the different sizes of the particles. But again, here I will assume that these three states are completely symmetric. There is not any big or small particles, which is another way to say that the repulsion does not play any role in the dynamics of the internal state. OK, so I can formulate directly uh, this uh, stochastic process at the continual level. So I will have uh, dynamics for the uh, population of uh, particles in each of these three types. And as you see, you have a free diffusion, which is due to the fact that you have not any constraint on density on neighboring side jump. And then you have this type of uh, dynamics, which will be a uh, jump between internal states. And as you see, the transition rate here is given by an Arrhenius form, where I will have a current f, which promotes a cycle in internal state in the given direction. So this is meant to mimic the uh, deformation of the particles. And then I have this type of interaction, which says that on site, there is a local synchronization so that if there are many green particles on a given side, then the particle which jumps will like to become green as well. OK, so in short, we have three ingredients. We have free diffusion. We have a synchronization, which is fully connected on site. So I can pile as many particles as I want on site. They all synchronize. And we have the drive, of course, which will promote a current in internal state. OK, so if you try and again characterize the phase diagram here, we do so in a way where we distinguish either a local version of the order parameter which is defined in terms of the local population of the three states uh, scaled by the local density. Or we have a global version of this order parameter, where we consider here the total population of a given state integrative of the system divided by the total number of particles. So the reason why we want to make this distinction is because when you have any sort of patterns emerging in the system, then you will have a discrepancy between the local and global order parameter. So this is a way to characterize inhomogeneities in the system. So you can start by looking at the regime of very high diffusion. And in this regime, you see that the local behavior and uh, the global behavior of the order parameter are the same. This is essentially the uh, mean field limit. And what you see is that when you ramp up the synchronization, you start from a disordered state, and you slowly increase uh, the order parameter to arrive in an ordered state. So I can show you uh, simulations of this microscopic model. OK, this one. So these are two order states. And interestingly, again, you reproduce the fact that you can have either an order state which is cycling on the left. So here, the colors correspond to the phase. And you will see that, indeed, uh, the, uh, the system is homogeneous. And it cycles between the three available states, which are pink, cyan, and yellow, which corresponds to the three states of the particles. But you will also have this type of ordered state, which is not arrested. Right? So if the synchronization is high enough, you see that there is a first relaxation that you see now. And after a transient, indeed, all the uh, phases of the particle are stuck at a given of the three state. So this is quite striking in the sense that the three states are completely symmetric. But the reason why you have here an arrest is simply because 
the fact that you have a finite number of states means that jumping between states is always costly in terms of synchronization. And in particular, in large and limit, right, it becomes possible to have this type of states where the global phase stays stuck uh, in one of the three states. Okay, so at this stage we realize that, well, we already have two of the main phases of pulsating actimatter. We have a globally ordered state which is cycling, and we also have a globally ordered state which is arrested. And then if you decrease uh, the diffusion uh, coefficients, you will see that now you have a discrepancy between local and global order. This is a signature of inhomogeneities, and indeed what you will see then is that this corresponds to the formation of waves in the system. So again, you can have either a planar wave, which propagates in this manner, or you can have the spiral wave. And if you see the spiral waves, you see that basically it's a coexistence between, again, the three main states, which corresponds to the cyan here, pink and yellow, which are corresponding to the three microscopic states of the model. OK, so all in all, what we see here is that I would argue that this type of reaction diffusion, which is fully connected, synchronized on site, is an instance of pulsating actimatter because it has a fully synchronized state cycling, it has a fully synchronized state arrested, and it has the waves that we were looking for. So the reason why I'm bringing this model is essentially to arrive at this slide, which is giving you the hydrodynamic behavior in terms of the density, which is the sum of the population of the three states, and in terms of the local order parameter, which is again the sum with this exponential weight. And what do we see here? We see that the dynamics of density is very trivial, is just relaxing to a flat profile. This is what we expected. But interestingly, you see that the dynamics of the order parameter here is reminiscent of what is known in the literature of reaction diffusion as a complex kings volando equation. Right? So what we have here is the power law expansion in terms of A and its uh, complex conjugate, A bar. And we also have a, here a diffusion term. And if you try and compare this equation with the original complex kings volando equation, you see that if you shift the face of uh, this complex order parameter A, you do not leave the equation in volumes. So what it means is that there are some phases which are preferred in the model, and indeed this is the reason why you have an arrested state. So you can learn a bit more. In particular, if you kill uh, the synchronization in the microscopic model, you are back to a linear dynamics, right? Which tells you that indeed the synchronization is the main factor which leads here to non-linearities at the hydrodynamic level, and therefore which can uh, stabilize patterns. Okay, so what we learn from these minimal models is that actually you don't really need repulsion to have pulsating actimatter, all you need is an internal drive, which is a monomolecular reaction. You crucially need synchronization. This is the ingredient that will lead to nonlinearities at hydronomic level. And then you need diffusion, but again, you don't need really to have nonlinear diffusion. Free diffusion is actually enough to reproduce um, this type of uh, behavior. Okay, good. So. Um, let me conclude um, on, on this talk uh, by saying that I hope I've convinced you that pulsating actimatter is an interesting instance of active system. It's quite different from the one we are used to. There is not any motility. Instead, the activity is the ability of particles to deform. This was the first model, or from a more general perspective, is the fact that you have a periodic drive of some internal degree of freedom. We've tried to build an analogy with reaction diffusion, and in doing so, we can essentially see that the spiral waves that we see in uh, both models are very much reminiscent of the spiral waves that we see, for instance, in the belusov davutinsky reaction in this type of, uh, of experiment. So let me conclude indeed and thank uh, Yi Weizang, who is the PhD student who drive most of the first project, Alessandro Maricorda, who is a Marie Curie fellow also uh, in the group who drove the project on the lattice model. And thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to take questions. Uh, so, uh, it is uh, right at the beginning, uh, so when you showed that there is uh, this pulsation, yes. so uh, I wondered that overall the system is incompressible, right? So from where the extra material is coming, like when you are uh, increasing the volume? Because you don't have any cavitation or anything. So uh, the back contraction is constant, yes, yeah, that's sure. And the idea is that indeed when you, therefore when you 
bulkily contract the cells in order to maintain the backing fraction, this means that you have to have expansion somewhere else, right? And I was arguing this is the mechanism which drives the contractional waves. Again, provided that you neglect uh, the death and, and, and birth of cells, and provided that you are in a confluent uh, type of setting. Okay, but uh, when you showed the overall expansion and contraction, so yeah. in that overall expansion cycle, then it will not work, at least for your system size, right? So in my system, the, it's not exactly the same in the sense that there are actually um, there are fluctuations of the packing fraction, right? There are, there are regimes where, um, where the particles are not completely overlapping. Uh, and so, so if I try and show you again uh, the movies, um, so for instance, when you have, you see when you have uh, waves of this type, you could argue that, uh, that the uh, fluctuations of packing fraction uh, are quite small, so the system is fully packed overall. But interestingly, if you look at now, for instance, uh, these parallel waves, uh, if you look at it in, in more details, you see that there are clearly fluctuations of packing fraction. So when it's green, it's uh, quite packed, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost crystalline. But when it's uh, oh, pink, it's... you see that clearly you... Oh, those are gaps, actually. That's right. Okay. Exactly. So in that respect, um, we, we expect that the, the propagation of contraction wave here is accompanied actually by uh, compression waves. That's right. So this is, this is something that, for instance, in the other model, we completely neglect, where we were saying that the density profile is completely flat. This is not true, actually, in this case. Yeah. This is something that we would like very much to, to, to understand. Right? If you look at the phase diagram, so the, the, this type of state, which we call defect turbulence, is really at the, very close to the order as this state. And then it's when you reduce density that you have this forming. Right? But how this, is this a transition, first question? Uh, and then uh, you see that, interestingly, the going from defect turbulence to that is not only allowing for a compression wave to occur, it's also allowing for the number of defects to, to completely decrease, right? So you go from an extensive number of defects with a very little uh, compression wave, or negligible ones, to a sub-extensive number of defects, even a defect-free solution, with now uh, pressure waves. Uh, this is something we see and we're trying now to characterize, but at the level now, it's only very uh, qualitative, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Here, I think, yeah. Yeah, so um, th there is now very clear evidence from experiments at least that uh, heterogeneity in cell stiffnesses plays a crucial role in uh, migration or metastasis or whatever it is. Okay. At the level at which one needs to capture waves, I assume you uh, assume all cells to be identical in, in, in your model. Is, is it, uh, is it uh, how close do you get to an experiment where you do have heterogeneities present? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so indeed, the, the, although the size changes, the strength of repulsion does not, yes, right? Yes, yes. Um, so what, one version of, of the model that we are thinking about now is uh, assuming that, um, so the, the, the particles do not migrate. They are oscillating around the equilibrium yeah, position, yeah. essentially. So you could have a version of, of this model where you have a, uh, indeed uh, a network of spring, right? And you could argue that the, the um, oscillation of the size is equivalent to uh, changing the, the stiffness of the spring equivalently, yeah. right? Yeah. So we argue that we don't have here change in strength of repulsion, yeah. but that effectively the changing the range could be seen as changing uh, the stiffness uh, that connects to neighboring nodes, right? Uh, but but that, thanks, that's a very good point. I did not know that this was actually experimental evidence. Uh, so, so, when, uh, so people know that during metastasis there, is, there are cells which have a completely different cell membrane stiffness and uh, the way they, uh, like the perimeter to area ratio is very different for those cells. I see. Which is telling you indirectly that the C these cells are different. I see. At least in their uh, stiffness constants. I see. Uh, so I was That's wondering, yeah. It's if it, yeah. by max B. Ah, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, so there is yet another version of this model where you could actually, you know, you could, you could start really from the vertex model. Uh, so Max B indeed is, is the main author there. And what you could do here is that you could promote this parameter, P naught, as a stochastic variable now, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you could actually oscillate this. Uh, so P naught is actually it's a perimeter per unit area, so you could oscillate this, which will be, I think, equivalent to what you propose. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And I would expect it would, you would lead to similar phenology. Yeah. So it would be interesting, though, because 
by definition, the, the vertex model, uh, there is no gap between the particles, right? Yeah. So it would be interesting to see whether you can actually have spirals with a vertex model, because in our case, what we see now, at least qualitatively, and that's what I was showing you in the, in the movie, is that to have spirals, you have not only to have uh, contraction waves, but you also have to have compression waves accompanying that. So that would be very interesting to consider a version of the vertex model. And there's also a possibility that these sort of defects start acting as sources of your wave centers. Many, uh, the waves originate from regions of low stiffness or high stiffness. It's uh, yes, yes. Well, I think to some, so this is quite obvious here, but to confirm that with the vertex model would be super interesting. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much. Okay, other questions? We have time. We don't have to clap yet. We have two minutes at least until 11. <laughs> it's quite, yeah, that's a good question. It's quite small. Um, so, yeah, so lambda is the parameter we change to control the amplitude of fluctuation, and we take it between 5 and 10%. Yes, so we, we so you can see it qualitatively, um, the, the change in size is actually not very significant. Right? So this is actually commensurate to the, to the parameter values that we use. And, and this is something that, so you could consider higher amplitude of, of oscillations. Would you? I'm not sure. No, because in that other model, this breathing model, so there you change the amplitude, there you have the uh, on, on set of plasticity. So you're thinking of the model by Berthier now. Yeah. Mm, mm. Um, so they don't have synchronization. And, but you say that when you have in this model, if the amplitude of oscillation is high enough, then you can have rearrangement and therefore you can have collective rearrangement. Yes, yes, that's a, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. To some, so in that respect, we, we add values. I don't know if it's true, but we, we could anticipate that this is below this threshold, right? So as to decouple these two types of physics, yes. Uh, but you could bring here this ingredient as well, yes. So how important would be the role of this persistence time uh, on these structures? that you see? Well, there is no persistence. So uh, for example, if you introduce, if you introduce persistence, then? I, I was trying very hard not to. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I think the closest analog w would be to, so you see this, this omega introduces a time scale, uh, and, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard to, to answer this question. So maybe, uh, you know, the closest to persistence here could be, the, um, could be the noise amplitude, right? So for instance, if you have active burning particles, uh, you would say that the dynamics of the self-propulsion orientation is theta i dot equal noise, and then dr is the inverse of the persistence. Um, so we have not studied in great details what is the role of the amplitude of the noise, um, and and that's a question which is quite uh, interesting. So this will obviously change. Uh, at least it will shift a bit this phase boundary. What is the importance of the noise on these two boundaries? We do not know yet, um, but that could be studied in, in more detail. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think yeah. But let's say if you in typically cells and all of that you have different uh, sizes. Yes. If you consider let's say polydispersed uh, equivalent uh, of your model, mm -hmm. and uh, and then this pul pulsating uh, particle will be equivalent to doing basically swap dynamics. If you're familiar with uh, the, this uh, swap Monte Carlo and all of this, yes, so this will be an equivalent. And and, and then uh, at the high high density regime, uh, this is going to uh, basically lead to. Uh, uh, stability, increase in stability of the material, and I, I don't know how they are going to couple to uh, your uh, wave propagation phenomena along with the stability. Um, yeah, the connection to swap indeed is is quite interesting. So the this was so the first version of this model without synchronization mm. was indeed introduced by uh, Ludovic and Elsen, and and as you say, changing the size, 
so in glasses systems, you have either small and big, you permute them, and yeah, you say that this, this is, is equivalent to shrinking the, shrinking, the big yeah, one. Yeah, particularly allowing uh, another so size, size degrees of freedom is a variable as well. Yes. And that leads to... So the point is that here, you want to have synchronization. This is really mm. what is driving patterns. And this was one of the main claims towards the end of this talk, right? Mm. Uh, but then this means that when you are dense, this synchronization actually kills the polydispersity, right? So in the, in the let me show you this movie again, in the very dense space, um, the, the, this, you, these particles are, are I would argue are almost of the same size, right? Mm -hmm. And and but let's see if you, if you start with a, a certain size ratio, let's say binary, okay. where the particle, uh, let's say bigger one can fluctuate with ten percent of its original size, mm -hmm. and a smaller one can fluctuate uh, also ah. around ten percent. But here, it's everybody is of eventually in a dense limit, they all become uh, very similar, right? But yeah. if you start with a binary or a ternary or multi-component where yeah. they have a given size ratio mm -hmm. ar around which they can fluctuate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then uh, I think the, the, those complexities, uh, yeah, so it's going to make your, uh, make the system more complex. Yeah. And whether the, that will, uh, that may play an important role because in, in real life, you're not going to have uh, all uh, cells or, or particles to have a similar size. Mm -hmm. And they may fluctuate around their own equilibrium size, or whatever, access Yeah, that's, size. that's a very good point. But I think the, the versions of swaps which exist now mm. are more or less along this line. So you have a distribution of particle, mm. uh, and what, what people actually try and do is that they, they so they, you have, uh, you don't have synchronization, but you have, let me, let me start from this equation, yeah. So you don't have synchronization, but you have this term, right? This term, yeah. And what people do, I think, uh, that's one also one trick that Ludovic introduced, is on top you have an external potential. Mm. So you have also one body potential on the distribution of the size, and the, the, the game is to be able to tune this one body potential mm. so as to enforce a given distribution of polydispersity. Yeah. 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 But, um, yes, so, so so I think this has been done to some extent. What is new here is really the synchronization. synchronization. So whether you could have two <coughs> populations, as you, as you were suggesting, where you, you mm. also, so you basically have two sigma nodes, that would be what you consider. So you, you have the same amplitude of fluctuations for each of these populations, but different reference value. Whether this sigma, this local synchronization, could help with respect to a standard swap, mm. this I don't know, could be interesting, yes. Mm. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Okay, I would say in the interest of not truncating the coffee break too much, I will ask my own questions there. I'm sure Etienne will be around. Okay. Let's thank Etienne and all the speakers of this session again. Thank you.